This morning, we are very pleased to have Jim Gaither returning to us. Jim has been a speaker for us uh, on multiple occasions, and uh, it's always very interesting to hear what Jim has to say. And today, his uh, topic is the implications of infinite mind. It always has an interesting topic. Jim has been an ordained uh, unity minister for a number of years, and he has both a master's in philosophy and a doctorate in theology. And he has been a minister in unity churches uh, for all, over the last 12 years and has published books. And he's also a regular contributor to Unity Magazine. Let's welcome Jim to our presence and hear what he has to say about infinite mind. Jim. Take it, we're ready. Okay. You're on. <laughs> all right, it's good to be back with y'all. Been a little while and it's always, I uh, always enjoy seeing you and uh, sharing uh, some thoughts. I'm going to start today with a, a a couple of passages from scripture, from the book of Genesis. Uh, Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man while he slept, and while he slept took out one of his ribs. The rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, these passages are from a story first told about 3,000 years ago. They illustrate the anthropomorphic concept of God, which people believed in 3,000 years ago. In case you're not familiar with the phrase anthropomorphic concept, it just means thinking of God as a super powerful human being distinct from creation. Bible study should include understanding of historical context and reflection on it as we would reflect on poetry or fiction. Learning about the origins of the Bible and reflecting on its content can bring us inspiration, self-knowledge, and insight into the nature of divinity. But taking it as literal, inerrant truth is liable to make us irrational and fearful. The Genesis story was told to convey the idea that our life comes from God. It is not a scientific or historical account of the origin of humanity. They didn't have scientific or historical methods 3,000 years ago, so they told stories. All scientific Cosmological, archaeological, and biological evidence today proves that the story is just not literally the way human species came into being and evolved. The anthropomorphic concept of God isn't merely outdated, it is completely unsupported by any evidence or logic. Beyond that, it can be troublesome. It causes people to think superstitiously Instead of, uh, instead of rationally, it causes people to have irrational feelings and to behave in irrational ways. Recognizing behavior uh, as irrational is not meant by me as a moral judgment, but simply a factual statement. Rationality is accepting ideas as true when all evidence and logic refute those ideas. Most of us, maybe all of us, occasionally have irrational thoughts, emotions, and reactions. If we are wise, we recognize our own irrational responses and learn from them. In psychology, irrationality is recognized as a symptom, a symptom of a number of different mental illnesses, including anxiety, anxiety disorders, bipolar disorder, delusional disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder and others. Stubbornly choosing to think irrationally is in effect mimicking symptoms of mental illness. In effect, preachers who continue to preach the anthropomorphic concept of God are encouraging people to think irrationally 
and to mimic symptoms of mental illness. Thinking rationally about God is part of what we attempt to do in metaphysical studies and to a great extent in theological studies. It's helpful to study the great uh, philosophical metaphysical tradition if we want to think rationally about God as metaphysicians. That said, the practical application of metaphysical truth to our lives is really quite simple, and I'll get to that point later. Theoretical understanding of metaphysics is important for practical application in the same way that understanding of scientific theory is important for devising effective scientific experiments and developing effective technology. It's not just an intellectual exercise. It helps us develop constructive applications. We could say that it helps us develop rational faith. Many philosophers, theologians, and mystics have concluded that God is infinite mind and our minds are part of that mind. They may sometimes call it spirit as well. Philosophers arrived at that conclusion that God is infinite mind or that there's an infinite mind at the basis of all reality. They arrived at that conclusion by thinking logically about reality. Fortunately for you today, I'm not gonna go into the whole history of uh, the whole intellectual history of philosophy. I'm just pointing this out. Theologians uh, arrived at the same conclusion also by reasoning, often strongly influenced by the philosophical tradition. Though sometimes theologians will try to align their thought with uh, the Bible by quoting biblical passages. Mystics have concluded that God is infinite mind based on their spiritual experiences. Mysticism is a worldwide cross-cultural uh, phenomenon that has um, sort of uh, been present in the different religious traditions. And it's only been, I think, since like the 19th century that people began to rec recognize that these mystics from different traditions, Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism, and so on, have many ideas in common about the nature of ultimate reality and how to experience that. So mystics, philosophers, even some scientists have inferred uh, or experienced God as the infinite. So, as I said, I'm not going to do a whole history of all of this, but I thought I would point out a few examples so you get the idea. I'll start with an example from the most orthodox of, uh, of orthodox theologians, I suppose, or one of the most, uh, Thomas Aquinas, who's extremely still influential in uh, Catholic thought and theology. Aquinas lived in the 13th century. And he wrote that God knows not only things actual, but also things possible to himself or to created things. And as these must be infinite, it must be held that he knows infinite things. In other words, God is infinite mind. Now, Aquinas tended to think, as other Catholics did and other religious people did, that God is a sort of separate mind. And I'll come back to that point. To quote just one of many idealist philosophers who's very explicit about this idea of God as infinite mind, I'll make I'll reference a 18th century philosopher named Gottfried Leibniz. You might have may or may not have heard of Leibniz, but he's a very important figure in the history of mathematics as well as uh, philosophy. Leibniz wrote, the supreme substance must be incapable of limitation. Once it follows that God is absolutely perfect, perfection being understood as that magnitude of positive reality, where there are no limits. That is to say, in God, perfection is absolutely infinite. I like the idea that uh, Aquinas recognized God as knowing not just the actual, but also possibilities. That's where the infinite comes from. Possibilities or potential is something real, but we don't, don't often take it as being real. But if there weren't real potential, there couldn't be any actual manifestations. And Leibniz's idea of God as being infinite, absolutely infinite, must also be perfection and that the universe itself must be 
perfection, even if we don't necessarily always understand that perfection. Leibniz was one who famously said, we live in the best of all possible worlds, or God created the best of all possible worlds. Uh, that view has been held up to ridicule, ridicule by some, but uh, I think there's a great deal of sense to it. I won't go into the idea of perfection today, but if you think about a universe that conforms to uh, mathematics, that has balance, that has a harmony, and that in that sense, we can think of uh, perfection as at least part of what the infinite would be. And so uh, that's an example, one example from philosophy. Another example I take from the, the history of mysticism, this uh, a, a Catholic uh, mystic, actually, a lot of mystics were Catholics because, well, Catholicism was the main religion for a very long time. Um, I'm referring to Nicholas of Cusa, who was um, one of the greatest mathematicians, scientists, and philosophers of his era, or really of any era. He's quite a remarkable individual in a lot of ways, ahead of his time in a lot of ways. Uh, and strangely, he also happened to be a cardinal in the church. He lived in a time where there was a little bit more tolerance of unusual ideas. Uh, Nicholas believed in, for example, in universal salvation, which obviously isn't part of the wasn't part of the doctrine of the church. But he wrote wrote it out and wrote about it in such a way that it was subtle enough that the the people that were in power didn't really notice. You know that that's what he was saying. But in any case, um, the the. The, the thing that I want to sort of emphasize in this case, he's not only, he was not only a mathematician and scientist and philosopher, he was also a mystic and recognized as such. And like a lot of the philosophers or a lot of the mystics in certain eras of, of uh, Christianity, um, Nicholas would, would write some of his mystical writings as if he were speaking to God. And so this little passage um, sort of places God as, as, as a, in a way, as if he's talking to God. But the, the point is within the passage. He says, when I behold thee as absolute infinity, then indeed I begin to behold thee unveiled and to enter into the garden of delights, for thou art infinitely and absolutely exalted high above all such things. Nicholas was the one who coined the phrase coincidence of opposites. The idea that in the infinite, the things that we think of as being in opposition are actually somehow reconciled and unified. So it's a very subtle sort of, uh, sort of philosophy, but the point I wanted to emphasize is the idea of God as infinite being or infinite mind. The co-founder of Unity is the last quote I'm going to mention, Charles Fillmore. Uh, Charles Fillmore was a metaphysician, he was a theologian, and he was also a mystic. One of the things that Charles wrote in a very sort of straightforward and clear way, God is not a person. God is spirit, infinite mind. Another thing he wrote is God is your higher self and is const in constant waiting upon you. So in this, in this mystical, metaphysical perspective, there's an absolute unity and we can even think of god as sort of the one or this infinite mind as the one self and that that one self is constantly supporting us uh, as we call upon it as we recognize it one difference between the metaphysical understanding of god and much orthodox theology is that the metaphysical concept of god is incompatible with mysticism while orthodoxy i'm sorry is compatible with uh, mysticism, the the, the um, metaphysical understanding of God is compatible with uh, mysticism, while orthodoxy tends to marginalize or even to persecute mystics, at least in the Western tradition. Another difference is that metaphysics works out the logical implications of what it means to say God is infinite mind, while orthodox theology, even if accepting the idea of God as infinite, doesn't work out the logical implications because of this tendency to focus on an anthropomorphic concept of God. Based on the understanding that God is infinite mind, we can experience the world in a new and better way. That's why this teaching is called practical metaphysics. Since God is infinite mind, God is omniscience, that is knowing everything. 
And the knowing of everything must also include logically the knowing in all individual experiences. Omniscience, all knowing, infinite mind must include all individual experiences rather than being outside of individual experiences. So right now, the infinite mind is knowing in us, as us, and through us. The infinite mind is the knowing in you, the knowing that is and expresses as you and through you. The practice of thinking about God, as mystics do, opens the way for us to experience the infinite perfection that Leibniz and others spoke about and to experience that as our lives, as our experience. If we try to think about omniscience or infinite mind in a sort of linear logical way, and a bit, it's a bit like trying to, to count to infinity, we will never come to an end point. And that's why mystics agree that ultimately God is indescribable. Still, we can get a useful concept of infinite mind by analogy. Think for a moment of the infinite mind as like a book, let's say the Bible. You look in the Bible, it contains stories, poems, prophecies, and wisdom sayings between its covers. It's already there. All that is already there. And as we read the Bible, we have responses and interpretations. Just as we experience life, we have responses and interpretations. We might vaguely visualize the stories. We might have feelings about what we are reading. We might reflect upon and interpret what we are reading in new ways. We might empathize or identify with the characters we read about. We don't just experience words, we experience imagery, feelings, and thoughts. We may even experience the sound of our inner voice reading the passages, acting in effect as a narrator. Now the book as an object is like the universe within infinite mind. Infinite mind contains the whole book and all the information in it, contains it immediately, contains all at once what's in there, just as a book does. On the other hand, the information in a book can also be experienced in sequence a bit at a time as we as individuals read the contents of the book. This sequential linear experience of reading the book is a different level of experience from already knowing all the content. So at one level, infinite mind already knows the whole story, all truth, and all possibilities. At another level, infinite mind experiences the book from every finite individual perspective, sequentially, right? Infinite mind experiences itself in, as, and through us. In other words, individually, we are infinite mind experiencing the universe a bit at a time through unique individual perspectives. Now, any analogy that we might use to talk about the infinite is going to be somewhat insufficient, not complete. Um, the infinite, the infinite ideas of infinite mind cannot obviously be contained between any two covers or any millions of covers. The story is limitless, eternal, outside of time in a sense. The plot and the ending are not fully determined because again, we're talking about the infinite, which is not a fully determined thing. So through individual minds, the infinite mind makes choices, the choices that you and I and others make. The possibilities for choice are known at the level of infinite mind, but the choices are made freely at the level of individual experience within individual mind. Those choices are not determined. There's a creative freedom in experience. It's as if we are reading the book yet at the same time making choices about how the plot will unfold and how the central character of our story will change. We create the story as we are experiencing it. So it's not determined, it is evolving as we make choices. 
every choice we make generates a possible world of experiences. For example, after this service, right now you're experiencing this, but after this you will choose to do something and you have many choices, right, of what you will do when we're done. We have choices while we're experiencing. And once you choose a possibility, you actualize a possible world. You also choose not to experience other possible worlds. So if you do one thing, you choose not to do others. Infinite mind at the level of infinity knows all possible worlds, but at the level of individual perspective, it, infinite mind experiences one possible world at a time. We are doing that. We are creating possible worlds with our choices. And your experience in this body, of course, is not all that you are. Your body is not your true self, but rather an evolving idea in your mind. Your mind is a field within which ideas and experiences evolve. Your mind field is an emanation of infinite mind through individual perspective. You are, we all are, God experiencing possible worlds. Your true self is one with infinite mind. Uh, the infinite one it is a witness uh, of evolving experiences in mind. Everything, even what we call physical, is experienced as ideas in our minds. Right now, you are experiencing something in your minds. Everything also is organized and harmonized by divine law. Experience is fundamentally subjective and immediate. It all occurs in the context of our minds, of our consciousness. We cannot step outside of our minds to directly experience an objective reality external to consciousness. Consciousness is all we experience and consciousness is fundamentally subjective. Think about even a scientist's observations and experiences and results, though they claim to be about an objective world, all those observations, experiences, theories, and results are subjectively experienced by the individual scientists. The truth of science is not objective, if by objective we mean a material world external to their minds. This is not to say that the world is an illusion, but only that it consists of mind and ideas. Scientific truths arise from intersubjective ag agreement. In other words, the results of one scientist's sub experiences subjectively is supported by the subjective experience of other sci uh, scientists. Intersubjective agreement. Intersubjective rather than objective. If you think about it, medical science implicitly acknowledges the laws of mind because research into possible cures always involves placebo groups, groups that get fake treatment to compare to the treatment being tested. Medical research continuously demonstrates that some people are cured just by believing or hoping they are receiving effective treatment. In some research, the placebo effect, that is the belief, has been more effective than the medical treatment that's being studied. And when that happens, they don't, they don't verify or they don't um, promote that kind of treatment because it doesn't it doesn't work any better than belief. In a 2014 scientific study, a meta what they call a meta analysis study of placebo surgeries, researchers found, and this is a direct quote: in half of the studies, the results provide evidence against continued use of surgical procedures. In other words, in half of the studied half of the studied surgical procedures, the placebo surgery worked as well or better than the actual surgery. You just think about that for a second, right? Half, what would you expect if the universe is ultimately mind, an infinite mind? You would expect that belief could work as well, as, often as well as something that we uh, think of as uh, physical experience. Placebo surgery worked as well or better than the actual surgery in half of these studies. 
Now, the truths of mysticism are, as in science, intersubjective truths. Mystics use meditative practices, they have a lot in common in terms of how they do those practices. And these practices result in deep subjective experiences that are often called mystical union or experiences of God or in Buddhist tradition, nirvana, because nirvana is described in very much the same way as mysticism is described in, in religions that focus on uh, the idea of God. The results, in other words, agree. There's an intersubjective agreement of mystics about what the truth is about ultimate reality. The only difference then between what we might call a mystic paradigm and a scientific paradigm, the only difference is that scientists experiment on physical ideas while mystics experiment with spiritual ideas. Mystics of every time and tradition testify that ultimate reality is infinite bliss, consciousness, love, absolute unity. An individual consciousness is inseparably linked to the infinite consciousness. As I've argued, it's contained within and not only contained within, but contains individual consciousness is contained within and contains infinite consciousness. You might say that the innate purposes of individual consciousness are to experience possibilities, to create experiences and possible worlds, and ultimately, from the mystic perspective, to realize oneness with infinite mind, love, bliss, all-knowingness. Now I come to the extremely simple practical application of metaphysics. One principle suffices to explain everything that's going on in practical metaphysics. Principle is just this, what you focus upon, you magnify in your experience. What you focus upon, you magnify in your experience. You are free to focus your attention on any ideas and any experiences you choose. If you're now focused on this meeting, that is what is magnified in your experience. If you direct your attention elsewhere, on a memory, on your surroundings, on a concept, that becomes your experience. Now, of course, I hope you continue to focus on this experience for a bit longer. What you focus on, you experience, magnify in your experience. Any human accomplishments, ma accomplishment, major or minor, is an effect of focusing attention on ideas. So if we focus on suffering or lack, we magnify that in our experience. If we focus on harmony and abundance, we magnify that in our experience. That's our choice. We can direct our attention to whatever we choose. And we can withdraw our attention. We can withdraw our attention from suffering and lack and redirect our focus and thereby change our experience. We immediately change our experience as soon as we shift our attention. The mystic metaphysical cure, therefore, for anything is to withdraw attention from the problem and focus on attributes of infinite mind. The mystic metaphysical cure for illness is to withdraw attention from feelings of illness and focus on feeling God as the presence of infinite harmony and life. The mystic metaphysical cure for lack is to withdraw attention from thoughts of lack and focus on God as infinite omnipresent substance and supply. It's a very simple thing, but it does involve make consistently making choices. So it can be challenging initially, but anyone and everyone can shift their consciousness, shift their attention. The metaphysical cure for unhappiness is simply to withdraw attention from unhappy thoughts and focus on God as infinite bliss. The mystics recognized that one can experience this bliss, one can experience healing simply by shifting our attention to the ultimate, to what I've been calling infinite mind, but what others would call God or Nirvana or even the Tao in Taoism. The regular practice of sitting and focusing on God can even lead to the experience of Nirvana or mystic union with God. So this is what 
metaphysician and the mystic knows. Where my attention flows, there my experience goes. Where my attention flows, there my experience goes. So the mystic says, I choose to focus my attention on divine light, life, and love. I choose to focus my attention on divine ideas of health, wealth, wealth and happiness. I choose to focus my attention on the divine ultimate, the infinite perfection. And in doing that, not only is the, the individual's experience transformed, but the individual consciousness becomes an agent of transformation for others. This is what the mystics have also experienced by focusing on the ultimate reality, whatever, by whatever name they call it. They may not only experience healing or experience personal transformation, experience bliss, but then as they go out into the world, their presence of peace and knowingness, life and light, then has an influence on those around them. That's why we know there are mystics in history because we have their writings. Why do we have their writings? Because they had an influence on others. Others continued to share those writings, some of them going back thousands of years. These things have lasted, these teachings, these ideas have lasted because of the subtle yet powerful influence of infinite mind working through individual consciousness. So I'm going to invite you now to join me in a time of meditation, a time of this focusing on God that can lead to this mystical union. So I invite you to become still and begin to shift your attention from the what we call the outer, outer world, sensory experiences, and move your attention inwardly into your own mind, which is linked to that infinite consciousness. It can be very helpful in doing this to simply begin by finding a comfortable position and focusing for a time for your full attention just on your breathing. Many times people like to begin their time of meditation by taking deep breaths. You can do that, or you can choose as I do to simply feel that natural rhythm of your breathing. Feel it, witness it, observe it, and allow yourself to relax into it. We turn our attention inward to our breathing. We are also turning our attention inward to the deeper realm, divine mind, that is what we are. can choose to direct our attention to divine ideas. So we consider this idea of infinite mind and what that really means. Infinite mind. We're open and receptive to that mind, to that reality. We call it God or Nirvana or Tao, by some other name. Open and receptive as we relax and turn our attention more deeply inward to this ultimate source, this ultimate nature of our being. Infinite mind. you experience now in your mind is an experience of that infinite mind. Your mind is inseparably one with that one universal reality. Whenever you have been 
praying for. Know that you are already one with that possibility your unity with the infinite mind that contains all possibilities, that is in its fundament, fundamental nature, perfection. There is an infinite mind, an idea of perfection for you. Buddhism, they call it the Buddha mind in Christianity, they call it Christ. Taoism, they call it the sage. That perfect idea of you is there as a possibility and as a possibility that is actualizing in and through you. There is a specific beautiful, perfect idea that is just for you to be, to experience, to manifest, just for you. So I cannot say, what is that idea for you? That is what you discover within yourself. can be said is there are divine ideas, there are qualities of the divine, eternal ideas that are part of every perfect idea. As you relax and move inward, you experience a deeper sense of peace. Peace is a divine idea. It's always there always there for us to experience in any situation, divine peace. Simply directing our idea, our, our consciousness to ideas of peace, serenity, calm. We remember what that experience is. We experienced it at various times in our lives and now we choose Experience it again, find the peace. The unity of the universe, the unity of infinite consciousness, we experience as what we call unity or oneness or love. Word love covers many meanings of interconnectedness. Goodwill towards others, compassion, empathy, affection, and even attraction. This idea of oneness and unity and love means that as we call to mind others, we can behold them as divine beings. And beholding them as divine beings, we support them in experiencing healing and abundance and guidance, divine order and whatever else is needed. We connect and support simply through love, compassion or empathy or affection, through consciousness of oneness. So if there's anyone that you are praying for, or praying with, simply recognize that now your consciousness of peace is connected to the peace that is part of their very nature. You support them in being that peace. With infinite mind, we experience wisdom the infinite intelligence, the basis of all good judgments, good decisions. So if you and others have this need to make a good and wise decision. We simply know wisdom is within you. Divine wisdom is guiding you. 
You are one with divine wisdom. I am one with divine wisdom. You're open and receptive to the light. infinite mind that is peace and wisdom and light is also life existence more than existence energy harmony health divine idea perfect idea that you are in reality has this quality of harmony life, energy, health, strength, all the qualities we associate, wholeness and harmony. All this is within you now, always has been, always will be. You can direct your attention to that perfect idea that you are and recognize you are this health, this life, this God manifesting. As you focus on these ideas and the presence, divine life and harmony within you, you begin to feel that life and energy and harmony. In the form of your body. The peace and the light, life is in every part of you. soles of your feet to the crown of your head, your legs, torso, arms, internal organs, throat, head. There is only this divine reality of harmony, energy, peace. Just let it flow. Just experience it. Let yourself be that idea, that reality. You're linked to the infinite source of all good, of all supply limitless source. We let go of ideas of lack and limitation and open ourselves to the divine abundance, the infinite source. And trust that right now, all that we need, and perhaps even more than we need, is now being drawn to us and expressed through us. We rest for a few moments in the silent experience, divine light, love, life, and abundance. Be still and know the I am God. We move forward from this day. We begin to once again direct our attention to the world around us. We bring with us this life, light, and love it is with us always, and we can turn our attention to this innate perfection anytime we choose. For that truth, we are grateful and we say, so it is. Amen.